Good morning, everybody. It's H. Weber. The dog is in the kennel. It's another edition of Weber This Week here on FingerLakes1.com. Today, a couple of my old pals join us, a couple of teachers that have had a combined 77 years working in the educational system, and they're still walking, and they're still talking. Pretty amazing. Tony and Mike Farrar are my special guests this morning for an extended version of our show as we have lots of things to talk about. And baby, it's getting cold outside. Huh? How about that over the weekend? Uh, yeah, the golf clubs were not even thought about using the last couple of days, but we're hoping to play later this morning. Good morning, everybody. I hope you all had a great weekend. And uh, without further ado, it's uh, always a pleasure to bring in people that I've known a long time. Uh, Mike and Tony Farrar. Mike, thanks for coming in. Morning, Harold. Thanks for having us. Tony, um, as well, uh, thank, thank you for you. coming in and spending some time with us. So we had these guys booked a couple of weeks ago, and uh, uh, Mike had a little trip down to Cooperstown, and uh, I don't blame him for one bit. I played that course years ago, and uh, I understand, Mike, the experience was one you won't forget. Never forget it, Harold. <laughs> Never forget it. <laughs> well, let's talk about 77 years combined between, of course, Tony retiring uh, what, a couple years ago, Tony? A year ago. A year ago, and, of course, Mike, August 31st. Correct. Was the farewell date. Mike, let's start off with you. Let's talk about your background. Obviously, uh, uh, for the folks that may not know you guys, which is hard for me to believe in the area, but talk a little bit about Mike, where you were born, where you went to school, and when you got involved in teaching way back when. Well, uh, born and raised in Seneca Falls. Uh, still happen to live in our family's homestead. Uh, my wife and I bought that, uh, but was, uh, we're Tony and I and my little brother David were raised, and my father was raised with uh, 13 brothers and sisters. But anyway... Uh, Went to St. Pat's uh, until eighth grade, and then on the Minders. Uh, from Minders, I went on to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, graduated from Pitt in 1979. Had the good fortune of being there when uh, the Panthers won the national championship mm. with Tony Dorsett. Uh, graduated from uh, Pitt and was fortunate enough that there was a teaching position open in Seneca Falls, and uh, I was able to go there as a long-term sub. Um, and then there was some talk that it was going to be a full-time position, but uh, after two years, uh, that position became uh, was filled by the person who was out on uh, a long-term leave. So I uh, subbed for a year, I believe, and then I was fortunate enough to hook up at uh, Geneva City Schools in 1983, and uh, spent most of my or all of my teaching career there at Geneva High School. I was. Um, Global Studies teacher and economics teacher at Geneva High School and uh, left Geneva High School in 1998 and uh, landed my first administrative position. <coughs> I've gotten my administration degree, uh, my master's out of Cortland and then my administration degree out of Brockport. And then um, in 1998, I started as the assistant principal at Waterloo High School, spent three years there, and then they uh, became the middle school principal uh, at Waterloo Middle School and spent 17, or excuse me, uh, 14 years doing that. And then the last two years of my career, I was the back to the high school as the high school principal. Mm. That's quite a background. Tony, how about yourself? Everything is the same coming through grammar school and Minders Academy. Still haven't been paid for him buying the house yet. I'm still waiting <laughs> for that check. It'll be in the mail. <laughs> uh, after high school, I went and shared time at the University of Nebraska at Omaha and Lincoln. I received my first teaching job in the Council Bluffs, Iowa School District. Stayed there for four years. Moved back to Rochester in 1978 and taught four years at Aquinas Institute. Coached basketball, was an assistant football coach. One year at Bishop Kearney and then had the good fortune to return to my alma mater as an assistant principal in 1984. Worked with Mr. Gerald Macaluso, my mentor sure. and excellent friend. In 1988, he moved on to bigger and better things and was promoted to the building principal and stayed there until I retired in June of 2014. Wow. I think the first thing I'd like to t get you guys to comment about, security at schools has been the topic, has been the national headline about every other week now relative to somebody coming in. Um, with guns or a gun, um, causing uh, obviously uh, many deaths. Uh, uh, Mike, let's go to you first. Uh, do we see a day coming where there'll be a police officer in every classroom of every school in this country? I mean, uh, I know people say, well, these folks that are doing these types of heinous crimes are mentally ill. Uh, where do you see this going? I mean, it's just something like it seems like it's happening every week and a half. 
Well, I think it obviously you hear about it because of the tragedy behind it. Uh, I, I don't think you're going to see a police officer in every school. Uh, I think obviously as an educator, your first priority, uh, especially at the administration level, is to create a safe and orderly environment. And I think the vast majority of schools have, have done that uh, through different ways, uh, you know, through no access into the building, only one, you know, it used to be every door in the building was open, now every door is locked, every door is censored. Uh, for the most part, there's only one way to get into a building uh, for the most part. Is it 100% secure? Absolutely not. Um, we're kidding ourselves if we think we can protect ourselves completely, uh, but I think there's measures in place to do that. Uh, you know, a lot of bigger schools, uh, inner city schools and uh, bigger suburban schools have gone to metal detectors. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's an issue, but the bottom line is I think if uh, a person is mentally ill enough and they are determined enough to Cause hurt harm. somebody, it, it's going to be very difficult to stop that. Uh, but every school has uh, evacuation plans in place, every school, I mean, as a principal, and Tony will tell you, every principal's greatest fear is uh, something tragic happening in your building. So you spend a lot of your time preparing and making sure your staff and students are prepared for the worst case scenario. So uh, I think that's the best thing we can keep doing and uh, keep working on our students as far as uh, feeling good about themselves. And uh, you know, one of the things I'm most proud about is uh, starting a character education program and I think uh, the more that we can help students become people of character I think the more we'll see less and less of this stuff happening. T uh, Tony agree with the Mike's comments? I do absolutely you know we have y you can't put barbed wire fences around the campus and even if somebody cannot get in the building there aren't bulletproof windows and glass so if somebody is determined enough it's almost impossible to keep it 100 percent safe. You really have to rely on the students to not be afraid to say, geez, I think I see somebody that shouldn't be here. The staff to be well prepared. But in all honesty, and thank God it never happened to me in 40 years, I'm not sure if I was fully prepared, mm -hmm. if it actually happened. You do the tabletop experiences with law enforcement, the staff and the training. You have the security place in me or the security measures in place. It just is something you pray and hope that it never has to happen or it never did happen. And hopefully, you know, it somewhere along the line comes back to what's normal, whatever that term is anymore. But, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's something scary and you have to think about it. It almost takes you away and it takes a lot of resources away from doing what you're supposed to do, providing instruction to students. And Harold, if, yeah. if you, uh, I mean, a, a major kind of a theme in most schools that we try to teach kids is if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, the vast majority of kids have bought into that. And, uh, you know, I know, I know Tony has a lot of personal experience where kids come forward uh, and, you know, we keep them out of the picture, we keep it anonymous, but kids come forward on a regular basis saying, um, you know, Mike has something in his possession and he shouldn't have a knife or a gun right. or whatever and uh, so building that kind of a culture I think is is key to most schools uh, keeping it as safe as possible you know as I was pondering Mike Farrar and Tony Farrar my special guests this morning longtime friends of yours truly 77 years in the educational system uh, need I say more we're going to talk about a lot of topics and as I was preparing for this interview I, I thought about when I went to school uh, I graduated in 63, and as I told these guys before I went on the air, they couldn't wait to get rid of me. I was not a very good student. I was with Scabona, Ricky, Scataglia. Do I need to say any more? Uh, those were the cast of characters that I went to school with. Um, but we used to have a lot of fun. But one thing I recall is discipline. When <laughs> Back in the late 50s, early 60s, I know Mike and Tony are smiling about this. If I gave somebody a hard time, a teacher, I end up getting knocked against a wall. And I... My stepfather, as you guys know, Joe Maripis, was not the most friendliest stepfather I ever had, but he was brutal. And I never in my wildest dreams thought I didn't deserve getting grabbed by a teacher, literally. And I know these guys can remember those days. I'm not saying we should bring back corporal punishment. I'm not saying we should start hitting students. But what changed over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years where if you mouth off to a teacher, 
I remember getting slammed up against a brick wall for shooting my mouth off to some teacher. I understand today is a different environment, but I never, ever would go home and tell my stepfather that I got disciplined by a teacher because I'd get it doubly worse at home. What has changed, Tony, in regards to, I know teachers are great people. They work hard. Uh, they get criticized a lot for having summers off, big deal. But I, I wonder, what has changed dramatically? And teachers seem to me today, if you look at a kid cross-eyed, there could be an attorney in your office at 5 o'clock. Could you give us a little your thinking about, has it all changed for the good? No, it has not changed yep. for the good. Um, 5 o'clock is probably a little late. Okay. For an attorney or someone representative, an advocate to be right. in contact with you, but legalities, lawsuits, the media, the mm -hmm. social media um, certainly has its benefits. But there were many situations where, if a fight broke out, which mm -hmm. did not happen very often, uh, I wasn't back to my office making contact with a parent, and it was on YouTube or on somebody's phone being spread out wherever it goes. Um, but the underlying problem is the whole family structure, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, teachers are a little bit more liable, or, I mean, not liable, they're, they're more hesitant to say and do things out of fear that if they say something mm -hmm. or, you know, attempt anything other than restraint, that it's going to come back on them. And in some situations, it does. There's a fine line between restraint and you know, overexerting your physical right. authority or power. But a lot of it does come back to the family. You're right. Uh, you know, the last thing I ever wanted was my mother to find out anything <laughs> oh, that occurred God. in school. So do what you have to do, and <laughs> let's get on with it. I know it was a lot less paperwork in those days, that's for sure. But today, that's not the case. In, some situ in, in a lot of situations, you know, the student is right, and the teacher's wrong, or the staff is wrong, with some parents and you know at least let me explain both sides of the story before you develop your opinion as to what happened or what didn't happen so I think a lot of it has to go back to you know what families and what the structure of the students are mm -hmm. and the whole quote-unquote respect yeah there just does not seem to be the same amount of respect and some people will say well and you just said it fear slash respect Mm -hmm. We respected our adults, our yep. adult authority, whether we knew them or didn't, and we feared our families and our parents to say, "Boy, you are wrong." Yeah, Mike, picking up on that. I mean, you sit there as, and I think about this. You sit there at today's environment at school. I mean, kids can basically not do anything. They can't throw knives at you as a teacher, but they can give teachers a hard time to a certain degree. And basically, the teachers are sort of handcuffed to tolerate that they could send them to the principal's office i guess is that still something they do now is that still in effect I, I guess i i get confused of the teachers really are at the mercy of the students versus when we went to school the teacher was you respected them and you listened to them or else well i, I think obviously uh, the, the biggest thing is uh, is the family structure right um and when when I grew up, uh, and, and my two brothers, my mother raised the three of us, uh, as my dad died at a very young age, uh, she taught us what respect was about. And obviously that transcended into <coughs> you as a student and, and uh, as you grew up as an adult. Uh, the bottom line is, is that our family structure in the United States is uh, completely different than it was you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years yep. ago. And, exactly. and that's the key point. Uh, so many of our so many of our families are struggling economically. Uh, many are single, come from single parents. Uh, in many situations, the father is out of the picture. Uh, there's not that dual parents working together. Uh, not that a mother can't raise children, obviously they can, but uh, it helps when you have two parents at home. Uh, in most families today, because of the economic situation, both parents are working. Yeah. Uh, you know, a different generation, <coughs> that wasn't the case. and. When both parents work and they work eight, nine, ten hours a day, now they're coming home and they're having less and less time influencing their children. So there's a lot of other factors that are influencing our young people versus our families. And whether it be the social media or media in general, uh, movies, music, et cetera, 
uh, it all has worked to break down or deteriorate uh, the level of respect that kids have. Uh, I graduated in 75, and, I, and I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, I think when I was in high school, uh, we were worse than the kids are today. Not the respect level, but we did worse things mm -hmm. than kids do today. Uh, I think overall, kids are very well behaved in schools. Mm. And I know that may sound uh, critical to you, but it, it's a, something I strongly believe in. Mm. Uh, most kids are really good kids. Mm -hmm. And it all comes down to, you talk about teaching and teachers, it all comes down to good teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the teachers that have absolutely no problems in their classroom are teachers who are well prepared, uh, organized, have a set of rules in place, uh, they deal with their kids and their own discipline problems, and they use administration as the last resort. There are hundreds of teachers like that and in Seneca Falls and Waterloo, just talking about locally. And uh, the teachers that struggle are the weaker teachers. Just like in every profession, there's very good people and there's some weak people. Well, our guests this morning, uh, longtime friends of mine, and by the way, we, we keep talking about Tony and Mike. We should re refer to the other brother, David, who's a good friend of mine as well. David, of course, an accomplished attorney, and I can't figure out why he didn't go through the educational field like you two did. Did he ever think about going into teaching versus an attorney? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, was always David was always uh, more uh, – David's career started in uh, labor, mm -hmm. uh, human resources, and then – progressed into labor management. I probably went into education because, uh, you know, Tony was my mentor and followed more into his steps. Uh, so um, that's probably why. And for me, and I know for Tony also, uh, I always enjoyed the coaching part of it. And right. uh, I always, you know, I coached before uh, I got into teaching. So at St. Pat's and I enjoyed that. So that was, you know, an avenue for me. And I do remember those days. I remember doing my first basketball game for WSOW on St. Pat's, and uh, I had to go over and get approval to, to broadcast the game because uh, I can't recall the sister's name. And she called me in to her office and, and asked me what I was going to do. I said, I'm going to do play-by-play. -play. We're going to call the game because Pat, St. Pat's was a hot, flourishing team, and we wanted to cover it. We had sponsors dying to pay for it, and I recall – and she said, I'll talk to you at halftime, Mr. Weber. I said, okay. I said, you're going to listen to the broadcast? She said, yes, I am. And I remember at halftime, she called me into her office and said, I don't know what you're saying on the air, but it sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that as if it happened yesterday. St. Pat's, my first broadcast. And I think we did two or three games from that gymnasium, which was some good memories. Tony and Mike are with us for our brothers. We're going to talk about core curriculum. I don't know what that means. They're going to explain to you what that's all about. Speaking of teachers... Our superintendents overpaid. I mean, that's a topic that I keep hearing about. And is the school year not long enough? And is the school day going to expand? A lot of topics to talk about. We're going to go past 10 a.m. this morning. First time we've ever said that on this show. we got lots to talk about. This is Weber This Week. Tony and Mike Ferrara, my special guest. Let's take a break and hear from the great people that make this show possible. Hugo Lake National Bank, Bill Ryan and his team for all of your banking needs. Offices in Union Springs and Aurora, a fine sponsor of the show for over 30 years. DA Liquor, Seneca Falls. Amy Padula and her great team will find that right spirit for you every time. Tell Amy the dog sent you. Chichinos, live, laugh, eat well, it's the Italian way. It's also the Chichinos way. Place your order today at chichinos.com. Locations, Main Street, Waterloo, and 401 Exchange Street in Geneva. The Good Hotel welcomes you to come out and enjoy the revitalization of this historical landmark. Wednesdays, don't forget Ladies' Night with special priced drinks and half-priced appetizers. Tap is Thursday, and their chef serves a dinner special every night. The Gould Hotel in Seneca Falls. Steve Wadhams, Wadhams Enterprises, your employer of choice. Proud supporter of this show and local athletics. Bob and Leslie Ullman, owners of the Ullman Theater, in Lions as well as the Newark Pilots, a minor league baseball team with a major league ballpark. SenecaFallsCountryClub.com, awesome 18-hole layout, offering a 12-month payment plan, home of the toughest power four in central New York. Wilson Press, WPress.com, 
Seneca Falls, Rich Ricky, my good friend and his team, can handle all of your printing and mailing needs. Rich Ricky, Wilson Press, a fine sponsor of Weber This Week. Well, a show I've been looking forward to hosting for some time. Mike and Tony Farrar, 77 years of combined educational experience are my special guests this morning. We hope that you're enjoying the show. Uh, reminder, just to give you a segue into our upcoming shows, next week a couple of politicians are going to be on the couch. Steve Churchill, Cindy Lorenzetti will be coming back. And then on November 2nd, uh, Jimmy will be hosting his show. Uh, Sharon Holden of the Gould Hotel We'll be in talking about lots of things happening with the Gould and lots of things happening with the d- downtown district as well. And, of course, on November 9th, Dave Barnick, the south end of the county, the guy that I had the uh, proud uh, distinction of hiring him back in the 70s to help me do sports for WSFW when we went on the air. I think he got hired in 74, 75-ish. Dave Barnick, great guy. He'll be on the couch talking about the world of sports. Okay, guys, uh, Tony, if you take this core curriculum, you see a lot about it in the newspapers. Uh, what was the theory about that coming out? And what's the theory of what is it good? Is it bad? Uh, a lot of I read where a lot of schools opted not to take part in it. Could you give our viewers an explanation of what that is? The thinking the, behind that? The Common Core, Common Core, if that's what you want to call yep. it, um, probably initiated when you compare graduation rates in New York State, the United States, compared to other countries, Mm -hmm. which, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, they said that our students are not coming out prepared, uh, reading, math skills, scientific, Mm -hmm. those skills were just lacking compared to other countries. There is nothing wrong with the Common Core. The Common Core takes a question, it takes a theory, it takes a concept, and it goes more in depth. The student has to not only read it and do the math problem, let's say, has to understand what he's reading and develop and, and, and do some thinking about, you know, some critical thinking on how to arrive at an answer. The biggest issue with the Common Core was that it was pushed out way too fast. It wasn't well prepared. It wasn't put together in time for staff to get a grip on it. And it was one of those initiatives that let's work, let's develop it as it's coming out. And it came out K-12, even though the first modules were at the early age, because you had to prepare students. And it it just did not give staff the opportunity and the training or the education to, to be prepared for it. And now you take a lot of the core curriculum concepts, especially in math and in English, and one company is developing the syllabus and the modules and another company is doing the assessments. Hmm. So they didn't talk very well and I still don't think they have that correct as defined by, you know, we have a new commissioner, there's going to be some changes, the governor's looking into it. So who knows exactly what's going to happen. But, you know, like I said, there's nothing wrong with providing the opportunity for students to be able to think a little bit more other than say, You know, you don't just throw it down their throat and expect them to regurgitate. That day is good. I don't have any issues with it. The other issue I have, you know, you talk about opting out at the Mm -hmm. middle school level or the elementary school level. You can do that because you can't can't fail a student or you can't retain a student if he or she fails one of those tests. So it puts a lot of stress on the teacher, puts a lot of stress on the student, puts a lot of stress on the parent. So parents have the opportunity to opt out because there's no real consequence. You can't do that at the high school level. You can't do that when you start taking standardized tests to get prepared for college and whatnot. So I think opting out is not the best thing. Even though it doesn't necessarily count, that's an issue. The other big issue is Common Core, instructional delivery is one thing. Holding a teacher accountable for it is a different story. Mm -hmm. I had a superintendent a number of years ago before Common Core come out that had the thought that administrators should be compensated based on merit. And I said, fine, you give me, like an industry, a raw product. Mm -hmm. I develop it, work on it, build whatever I'm building. If the raw product is inferior and doesn't work, I have the opportunity, you have the opportunity, I'll take Ghoul's Pumps at Mm -hmm. the time, to send it back and go to another vendor. I don't have that opportunity with education. Parents send me the best students they have. That's the raw material. 
whether they come from an educated home, whether they come from parents that are really involved in their education or not, the bottom line is those are the best students we have and it's our job to make them all get to a certain point. Mm. So, and I have them five to six hours a day, five days a week, if I'm lucky. You look at the number of students that don't do well and you look at their attendance rate and my guess is you're going to see a direct correlation to poor attendance to poor academic achievement. Interesting. Mike, anything to add to that? Well, let, let's uh, <coughs> Common Core and opting out are, you know, are two separate entities. Okay. Uh, when you when you talk about people opting out, they're opting out of a state assessment gotcha. grades three through eight. Okay. Common Core, you can't opt out of that because that is the curriculum now, and what everybody seems to forget, the Common Core curriculum. Is it was a nationwide initiative. It wasn't a New York State initiative. Uh, 48 out of the 50 states adopted the Common Core, uh, which for the first time in our country's educational history was the first time there was a, pretty much a curriculum that was nationwide. Uh, the history of our country is that curriculum is pretty much a local decision and then the state also influences the curriculum. This is the first time it's been a nationwide initiative. Um, the bottom line is not only are we not competing with foreign countries, that's an argument we can sit here and talk about all day, but major American industrial, industrial companies and major companies are saying that our students are not prepared when they come out of high school. And they're right. We, we need to get better at what we do. And that was the purpose of the Common Core. Uh, and as Tony alluded to, the concept is a great concept. The, the, the rigor and the relevance of the curriculum uh, needed to be changed. Uh, and it did that with the Common Core. The implementation is where the whole thing was flawed. Mm -hmm. uh, they tried to implement it uh, in one year in multiple grades instead of progressively working up, starting in grade one and transitioning. So after 10 years, it would be fully implemented and everyone would have a chance to progressively move up that type of thing. But when you mix politics with education, <laughs> uh, things tend to get blurred. Mm -hmm. But Overall, Common Core is a great thing. They are still working on the assessment part of it and its connection to it. And uh, you'll see a lot of changes coming down on that one also. I'm sure both of you have worked with great teachers. I'm sure you both at administrative levels have worked with teachers that aren't so great maybe in your vo both views and your assessments as, as you got higher in the administrative totem pole. <clears throat> Tenure, uh, a word that is tossed around uh, that is obtained explain to me how do you deal right now with the tenure issue which many people have have been awarded versus a teacher who is not that good or has slipped the last several years in their careers and the state says well we need to weed out the bad teachers is it possible tony to do that given the tenure scenario probably not um Anything is possible, but you know education doesn't have the greatest resources financially. Mm -hmm. And to to just say weed out or let go right. somebody with tenure is not the easiest process. The mm -hmm. whole legal process is very difficult. More emphasis needs to be on when you interview, when you seek applications, when you when you hire someone and employ them initially and work with them in their first three or two or three or four years, whatever the tenure regulation is at this point, and it is changing. But, you know, to say, that, you know, I, I've had some phenomenal teachers. The majority, 99% the of my staff, Excellent. I would hire again in a minute. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you, when, you, when you, you get to know somebody, not, you know, I, I, told, I always told my interviewees that, you're not here to teach math, science, social studies. You're here to teach young people. Mm -hmm. Now, your subject matter is important, but there's a lot to go around with that. So I really don't think that's the big issue as far as tenure is concerned. You know, I think it started initially because teachers were making such poor money. Mm -hmm. And as they started to move up the ladder, it was easier to hire somebody again at a much lower rate, right. and they had no protection. So the whole tenure might be, you know, it's probably one of the only professions in the country that you're granted such a thing to say you're almost untouchable. But there aren't too many people, I think, that you just automatically want to get rid of, even after they've been working. And I don't think consciously any teacher says after a 10-year, 
all right, I'm on easy street for the next 27 years till I retire. They work hard. Uh, you know, somebody alluded to the fact that they have the summers off. Well, a good teacher does not have the summer off. They are working independently. They may be working in the district, working on curriculum innovations, working on their assessments, what did I do right, what didn't I do right, revising their curriculum. They're working extremely hard, a, a very good educator. So I, I don't think there's anything, again, in essence, with wrong with the theory of tenure. You know, people will say, and Mike's alluded to it earlier, there are weak or bad people in any and every profession. Sure. So, Mike? Mixed emotions. Uh, <clears throat> I think the real key to any successful school and uh, is, the, first of all, the administrator. Um, part of his and her, and her or his or her role is to be the person who works with people to become better at their profession. Um, and that, that's the key. Uh, I think one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of is, is, you want to call it a legacy, but as an administrator, you are hiring people on a regular basis. And I know the people that I have hired over the last 18 years in Waterloo, uh, the vast majority of them, 90, 99% of them, uh, will be there for many, many years influencing young people. Uh, personally, I, I, I'd like to see tenure out the window. Mm -hmm. I know why it originally started, as Tony said, it, it provided some protection. Uh, in a perfect world, are we sure that Seneca Falls Central School District won't get rid of teachers who have six, seven years experience to hire cheaper, cheaper, uh, less expensive people? I would hope in a, in a real world that a district wouldn't do that, but I'm sure at one time that happened. So personally, I'd like to see it a five-year probationary period, and then if teachers aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, then they need to be removed. Uh, the most frustrating part as an administrator was that you would tell a person they needed to do this, this, and this, and the recourse, if they didn't do that, was very limited, mm. okay? And it's, again, it's a very, very small number, but it only takes one or two people in your building out of a staff of 50 who cause that disruption. And if there's no recourse, that becomes the frustrating part. And, uh, and there really isn't any recourse. Uh, there's, there's two or three items that you can bring a teacher up uh, for removal. Immoral, something immoral. Immoral, insubordination, incompetency. But as Tony said, um, a district is looking at a minimum of $600,000 or more to remove a 10-year teacher. Really? Oh, really yeah. expensive process, huh? Yeah. Oh, wow. Or more. Wow. Yeah. Let's talk about the length of school days. A lot of discussion over the last several years I've been reading about. Uh, there's been talk, strict, quote unquote, talk. The school day is not long enough. Uh, summer break is too long. Tony, an opinion on that? I think especially at the lower levels, the retention level of young children, especially if the support is not there at home, where parents can reinforce reading, math, you know, being involved, and I don't mean basic facts, but, you know, there's a lot more to education than reading in a book or looking online. I, you know, experiencing different things with your family in the summer can be very educational. I, I'm not sure if going to school year-round is the way to go, but, and I'm not sure a longer day is the way to go. You know, I, I think historically, as we've progressed into where society is less effective at home, I think the thought was, you know, the old preschool, let's get kids in school quicker, let's keep them longer, let's have after-school programs. That had little to do with, and has little to do with, their instructional abilities. Is much more to be safe, to provide them decent meals, um, an after school program where they're not home unsupervised. But as far as an instructional day, I, I mean, you look at colleges and universities, you're paying fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year to send a kid to an undergraduate school. Hmm. They're never in session. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have to be. You know, I mean, now it develops where a, a young adult has to learn the self-discipline of doing work outside of class. So I, I think especially at the high school level, which was the predominant experience level that I had, that students were there enough. You know, I'd like to see the opportunity that if students chose to come 
and have reinforced skills. I don't mean summer school from a perspective because you failed, but just to be able to keep sharp, to keep to have the opportunities for growth, then I think it's a good thing. But I, I don't see that you know the money's ever going to be available mm -hmm. to send students to school year round. You know, the, you take the average attention level of a student in school, it, and it probably averages out to no more than 15, 16 minutes. Mm. And so a teacher really has to work hard to keep students engaged, and you have to do different things. You know, a teacher is no more a lecturer. They're more of a facilitator. You know, you want students to be able to do things on their own, to learn, and be guided in the right direction. That's, I think that can still be done in the course of the day. That's of the current school year. Mike, as far as hours? A little bit different. Uh, <clears throat> I, I feel very strongly that not mo longer hours or longer school year, restructuring is what I would be much more in favor of. Uh, personally, we do it incorrectly. Uh, secondary students, uh, especially grades 7 through 12, they should be starting school around 8.30. Uh, you look at all the research, they perform the best at 830 and uh, we start our secondary kids early. Uh, it's a complete culture change, but it's something that we need to look at very closely if you're following the research. Uh, so I'd like to see secondary start later and primary starting earlier. Uh, and the other thing is restructuring the school year. I personally think two months off in the summer is too long. Uh, the whole the original setup of our school year was based on an agrarian society. Young kids were needed at home at the farm to bring the harvest in. Mm. Well, we're no longer an agrarian society, nor have we been one for <laughs> the past 50 years um, or longer. So I'd like to see the school year restructured. I'd like to see us go to school 10, 11 weeks, have a week off. 10, 11 weeks, have a week off. 10, 11 weeks, have a week off. So we're going year round. We're not increasing the school year. We're still at 185 or 188 days of instruction, but it's it's broken up differently. And uh, But again, it's a negotiated item and it's something that districts have to sit down with their, uh, with their teachers and their teachers union and work those things out. And it just can't be Minders Academy goes to that schedule. It has to be something statewide initiative. And, I don't know if we're going to see that in my lifetime or your lifetime, but that's what I think, <laughs> Yeah, restructuring. And currently at the state level, you, you do not receive any state aid for any day of instruction or any day of school prior to September 1st. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> September 1st to June 30th, that's right. it. Wow. Yeah. So the state has to, or someone has to come across and say, okay, we're going to extend beyond that calendar time frame so that... Now, my, my guess is the tour, touring industry or the tourism industry in this country would have a lot to say about that. But, and I think they dictate a lot, to be quite honest. But right now, the finances are not there to support longer school year in the rotation that Mike mentioned. Interesting. I think, you know, we've gone past our 10 o'clock hour. I, I would like to get both your opinions before we wrap it up uh, regarding superintendents. Uh, it's been fascinating for me to read articles about uh, Governor Cuomo a few years ago questioning the salary structure of superintendents, claiming that, in his opinion, they're way overpaid. Uh, down in Long Island, I think he referred to somebody making $390,000 a year. Um, it does seem, without knowing superintendent salary, I know it's probably public information, uh, I need to get your guys' opinion. Are superintendents overpaid? And if so, how does it ever get changed? Tony? I don't think anyone in any professional is overpaid. Okay. My wife will sit here and say, how can Alex Rodriguez make $27 million a year to try to hit a basement? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And you put that in perspective. Yep. Is $390,000 a year when you are responsible for anywhere from a you know, I'll take our sure. budget at $20 million and my superintendent doesn't make $390,000, <laughs> so let's not, sure. let's get that out there real quick. The one of Waterloo does. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when you're responsible for the number of students, staff, equipment, infrastructure, I'm not sure if you can put a price on it. Hmm. You know, it, it, any one of us, if we have the opportunity to financially better ourselves and somebody is going to, there's a market to, 
You want $390,000 because you're very good at your job? Why wouldn't you take it? It's the American way. Mm -hmm. So I don't think overall there, you know, we heard about years ago where superintendents were making a ton of money. They were retiring, coming back as interim, making two, three thousand dollars a day. Mm -hmm. The media picks up on that. I'm sure, again, if I have that opportunity, I'll sign up tomorrow. But I don't think they're overpaid. I, and it goes by district. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, you know, I, I know what the superintendent in Seneca Falls makes, and mm -hmm. it's way, way, way under what he deserves. Hmm. He's a hard worker, and I've been fortunate to have the last two and even three superintendents that were very good. They worked hard. They had a lot of responsibility. They made some very good decisions. You know, you take Bob McKevney, Jerry McAluso, back to Dave Giles. Mm -hmm. they, they were excellent administrators and supported education and promoted the community to have a, a strong emphasis on education. So I don't think they're overall over, I, I don't think that's the right term to say overpaid. Mike? Well, uh, yeah, they're, it's an individual basis type of thing. They're, they're the C, if you look at it, what they really are in reality, <clears throat> they are the CEO of a school district. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just like you have a CEO of ITT sure. goals, okay? Uh, they're responsible for, you know, depending on the size of the district, hundreds of staff members. Uh, they are responsible for budgets in excess of $30 million. Uh, so in that respect, they're supposed to be also the educational leader of the district. So if the person who is the superintendent is doing those types of things, is providing the educational leadership, the professional de develop development resources, excuse me, uh, is keeping the district in good fiscal condition, then they are very much worth every cent they get. Uh, obviously, you did hear about the 300,000 plus, but you're talking about districts that are 50 times the size of Minders Academy. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about multiple layers of people and managing these people. Uh, again, I, I think for the most part, overall, every superintendent, most superintendents are worth every nickel that they're being paid. Very good. Very good. Um, Mike and Tony Farrar have been our special guests this morning. We've tried to touch on several topics that interest me that I was trying to think about what I would ask these gentlemen. Um, Mike, uh, as we wrap up the show, I'd like to have a closing comment about uh, since I'm a sports guy and you guys are sports minded as well, uh, and you guys have done so much well in coaching during your careers and uh, taking it to big heights, um, how important uh, or is it vitally important to have a sports program connected to the school district? The uh, reason I ask that question in a way because when a particular budget gets rejected by uh, the taxpayers, the first thing everybody s starts thinking, well, we're not going to have sports unless we go back and vote it in. How important it is that as a liaison to the student, Mike? Well, first of all, when people think like that, uh, there's only certain things that you can cut out of a budget that's been disapproved by voters, and sports is one of those things. Mm -hmm. It makes up such a small percentage of a total budget. So mm -hmm. uh, as far as I'm concerned, sports and other extracurricular activities are the critical part of any successful school. Uh, you cannot have academics without athletics and other extracurricular activities. Uh, it develops a well-rounded individual, and there's so many lessons learned on the athletic field or in the gym or in the band room or in the play or the drama that you don't learn in the classroom. So they go hand in hand, and any school that doesn't have a vi wide variety of extracurricular activities is not a very successful school. Tony, you like peanut butter, and you got to have the jelly. That's the sports side of it. That's, uh, and I agree with Mike 100%. You know, I'll promote it so much. Um, I'm more in interscholastic athletics, but I certainly attempted to support all the other programs. And when even talk started to come where you're going to eliminate it, um, you know, I fought it profusely. You know, one of the things is, well, let's, let's eliminate modified athletics, okay? <laughs> well, you might save $5,000, $6,000 tops when you take a salary and, and, and you take transportation. But what you've actually done is you've cut the legs off of your program. Mm -hmm. If you aren't developing students or players or athletes, then you're going to all of a sudden put them at the upper level and they're not going to be able to compete. So it's a cycle that's not a very good cycle. There's not, a, there's not an extracurricular program that I would see or would like to see cut, to be quite honest. I, I think they do certainly help and enhance students' ability to, to be involved, to have a purpose, 
we all know some students are better than others in different things academically as well as in, involved in the play or the musical. I think, you know, a parent or somebody that's not involved, go watch a student prepare for the play, mm -hmm. let alone athletics. And the discipline, the self-motivation, the organization of all the things that you have to balance, they're tremendous skills that you'll never learn in a classroom. So would never like to see any of that stuff cut. Interesting. Well, uh, Mike, Tony, thank you for joining us, and I appreciate coming in and spending uh, longer than we've ever done a show before because I knew there were a lot of topics we want to get into. I'm sure there were many more we could have got into, but thanks a lot for coming in. My pleasure. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Mike. Harold, thanks for having us. Uh, look forward to maybe doing it again down the road. Uh, maybe we'll meet up at the golf course. You never know. Again, thanks to Mike and Tony Farrar for joining us, getting an overview of what they thought. 77 years combined experience in the educational field. F pretty fascinating. I'm glad, to be, I'm glad I can call them both very good close friends of mine for many, many years. Uh, remember, next week, folks, a uh, couple of politicians. We go from a couple of uh, educators to a couple of politicians. Uh, no, there's no comparison. Uh, Steve Churchill and uh, Cindy Lorenzetti will be on the couch talking about politics, of all things, as we get ready for yet another election coming up in early November. Well, speaking for Mike and Tony Ferrari and Jim Sonicropi, this is the Dog H. Weber bidding you farewell. We'll catch you next week. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the week. It's supposed to be really nice weather-wise. Visit patreon.com slash fl1. Fingerlicks1.com. Call